Upanishads, the way of the masters. An excerpt from Tao Shu Buddha Upanishad, Volume 2, A Religion Without God. The word Upanishad is very beautiful and sacred. It carries a great meaning with it. It simply means sitting down close to a master. Upanishad is a communion. The master is living in wholeness here now. Indeed, he is pulsating here now. His life has music. His life is manifestation of joy and silence of immense death. His life is full of light and light overflows in myriad ways. Just to sit silently by the side of a master is enough because the presence of a master is contagious. The presence of the master is overwhelming. His silence starts reaching to your very heart as the words overflow. His presence becomes a magnetic pull to you and it pulls you out of the quagmire of the past and future. It brings you into the present. Upanishad is a communion, not a communication. A communication is head to head and a communion is heart to heart. This is one of the greatest secrets of the spiritual life and nowhere else at no other time. It was understood so deeply as in the days of Upanishad. Upanishads are sacred and pure because these are statements of truth experienced by the sages and these he shares with his disciples. Upanishads were born nearly 5,000 years before a secret communion a secret transmission beyond the scriptures and beyond words, a statement of truth beyond the finiteness of the words is what Upanishad is, sitting silently, not just listening to the words, instead listening to the presence as well. The words are only excuses or mediums to transmit silence. The silence is the real content. The word is only container. If you become too much interested in the words, you miss the essence of the being of the Master. Therefore, never be too much interested in words. Listen to the heartbeat of the word. When the Master speaks, those words are coming from his innermost core. They are full of his color, of his life. They carry the taste of the fragrance of his being. If you are open and vulnerable, receptive and welcoming, the fragrance will penetrate into your heart and the process is triggered. Carl Gustav Jung calls this synchronicity. It explains exactly what happens between a master and disciple. It is not the same as what happens between a teacher and a student. Between teacher and a student there is a communication. Certain information is transferred by the teacher to the student, but no transformation. Only information is communicated. The teacher himself is not transformed. He himself has not arrived. He is repeating words from other teachers. He may be even repeating words from other masters, but he has not known himself. His words are borrowed. He may be very scholarly. He may be very well informed. But that is not the real thing. Information is not the real thing. Instant transformation is. And unless one is transformed, he cannot trigger the process of transformation in others. Only one who has known 
can really create the magic of transformation. Carl calls this synchronicity. The master cannot cause enlightenment. Certainly enlightenment is not a scientific process. It is far more poetic. Beyond the law of cause and effect, it is far more liquid and flowing. The master cannot cause the enlightenment to happen in you, but he can trigger the process, and that too only if you allow, not against your will. Nothing can be done to you unless you are totally receptive. This can happen only in a love affair. Indeed, master-disciple is a love affair. Between the teacher and the student, there is a business, whereas between the master and the disciple, there is a love affair. And Upanishads are the embodiment of this love affair that exists between master and disciple. The disciple is surrendered and that is the meaning of sitting down. He is surrendered, he has put his ego aside, he is simply open in tremendous trust. Of course, doubt will hinder the process. Doubt is no more. Instead, there is loving trust. Indeed, with the master, doubt is a hindrance. It is not of asking a question. It is a quest of the soul. It is inquiry of the heart not intellectual curiosity. It is a question of life and death. When one is tired of all questions and all answers and all philosophy, only then one comes to a master. When one has accumulated much information and is still remains ignorant and all that information does not create any light within his soul, then he comes to a master, to sit by his side and imbibe his presence. The questions are no more. He knows now one thing, that all questions are futile. He has tried and he has seen the whole futility of it. Now he sits in silence, open, available and receptive like a womb, the disciple becomes feminine and only in those feminine moments the master, without any effort on his part, starts filling the disciple and this happens naturally. Both the disciple and the master are not doing anything, instead they are in a state of being. The master is being himself and the disciple is open. When your nose is not closed by cold, you pass by the side of the flower, suddenly the fragrance is filled. The flower is not doing anything in particular. It is natural for the flower to release its fragrance. If you are open, you will receive the fragrance. So too happens between the master and disciple. The word Upanishad means coming to a master and one comes to a master only when one is tired of teachers, all kind of teachings, dogmas, creeds, philosophies, theologies and religions and the way to come to a master is surrender. Not that your being is surrendered, only the ego, the false idea that you are somebody, somebody is special and you know your scriptures. The moment you put the idea of the ego aside, the doors are open. Suddenly the wind, the rain, the sun and the master's presence will start entering you. This will create a new dance in your life. It will give you a new sense of poetry, mystery and music. This is synchronicity. The master is beating in a certain rhythm. He is dancing on a certain plane. 
If you are ready, the same dance starts happening in you. In the beginning only a little bit and that little bit is enough. In the beginning only dew drops but soon they become ocean. Once you have tasted the joy of being open, you cannot be closed again. First only a window or the door opens and then you open all your windows and all the doors. And the moment comes in life of a disciple when not only windows and doors are open, even the walls disappear. He is totally open and available in his multidimensionality. This is the meaning of the word Upanishad. The open in all your multidimensionalities. The Upanishads are written in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is the oldest language on the earth. The very word Sanskrit means transform, adorn, crowned, decorated, refined. But remember the word transformed. The language itself was transformed because so many people attained to, to the ultimate. And because they were using the language, something of their joy penetrated into the language. Something of their poetry entered into the very sense, the very fiber of the language. In the process, with the passage of time, even the language became transformed and illuminated. It happened 5000 years before in India with Sanskrit. So many people became enlightened and they were all speaking Sanskrit and their enlightenment entered into the language with all its music, poetry and celebration. Sanskrit became luminous. Sanskrit is the most poetic and musical language in existence. Hence, Sanskrit sutras can be defined in many ways, can be commented upon in many ways. Indeed, they allow much playfulness. For example, there are 800 roots in Sanskrit and out of those 800 roots, thousands of words have been derived. Just as out of one root of a tree grows, and many branches and thousands of leaves and thousands of flowers. Each single root becomes a vast tree of great folly. For example, the root Ram can mean many things. To be calm, to rest, to delight in, to cause delight to, to make love, to join, to make happy, to be blissful, to play, to be peaceful, to stand still, to stop, to come to a full stop, and God, Divine, the Absolute. Indeed, these are only few of the meanings of the root Ram. Sometimes the meanings are related to each other, sometimes not and other times even they are contradictory to each other. Hence the language has a multidimensional quality to it. You can play with those words and through that and through that play you can express the inexpressible. The inexpressible can be hinted in this way. And significantly, Sanskrit language is called Devani, the divine language. And it certainly is divine in this sense because it is the most poetic and most musical language. Each word has certain music around it, a certain aroma. It happened because so many people used it that was full of inner harmony. Of course, these words become luminous. They were used by people who were enlightened. 
something of their enlightenment filtered into the words, reached to the words, something of their silence entered the very grammar, the very language they were using. Upanishads say that the world is the manifest form of God and God is the unmanifest form of the world. And every manifest phenomenon has an unmanifest embedded deep within. It is in this backdrop when the chief editor of Tao Cho Buddha Meditations, Swami Anand Nilamba, proposed a series, Tao Cho Buddha Upanishad. I asked him to choose the title. The first in this series was The Goose Was Never In and now A Religion Without God. When this title A Religion Without God was chosen, it was an important breakthrough from the God-oriented organized religions that all have failed to deliver the essential core of inness. The emphasis is no more on God, instead it has shifted to man who has all along been sitting on the periphery and God remained the center. When man is the center and periphery, he has no more excuses. All responsibility of transformation is his. And Master plays an important role in this process by providing direction that he remains on track. With this in mind, various topics, overflows were chosen. Some of these were not explained before. Indeed, religion without God is the beginning of the religion of meditation. Meditation is individual process free of all dogmas and philosophies. One simply is, one is not doing anything, no thinking, no one is feeling anything. This ishness is the ultimate experience of bliss. Beyond this there is nothing. This is eternal search. You have arrived home. This is meditation. Though meditation begins in mind, it is not real meditation. Begin with the mind, one day you will attain meditation. When the mind ceases, you are beyond it. Only then real meditation begins. Even to go beyond the mind, you have to use the mind itself. However, use the mind negatively, you will certainly attain meditation. And when you have attained to meditation, certainly one day the innerness explodes into myriad ways. Many flowers blossom and their beauty and fragrance begins to fill your innerness and then manifests in the outer realm. Deep within there is explosion of song and dance and on the periphery there is celebration. Inner beauty assumes the form of words pure and sacred and sublime yet beyond time and space. In the inner beauty assumes the form of words pure, secret and sublime yet beyond time and space.